In our previous videos, we developed the one-factor linear model, which described an individual score, the yij, as a function of three separate pieces, the grant mean, plus a treatment effect for group j, plus individual error. Recall that this interior portion that doesn't include error is the predicted score on y for the ith individual in the jth group. So this interior portion is really just a function of the grand mean and the treatment effect for group J. So the prediction for any person is really just the group mean that that person is a member of. In this case, we pick up some additional notation, the mu dot J. The dot here, again, is just bookkeeping to show that we've taken an average over individuals. But I want you to see that for this one factor linear model, and all the linear models we'll see later on in this module, the interior component that doesn't include error is simply the mean of a group. That is, we could also describe this model as a score on y for an individual is simply the mean of the group they're a member of plus that individual error. But by decomposing our group means into separate pieces, one part grand mean and one part treatment effect, we're able to actually test things about those toss of j's, specifically whether our factor has any contribution to the score on y for individuals in a population. So having that interior portion, which represents the mean of a group or the predicted score for a person, Having that interior portion separated into these different pieces allows us to use the inferential methods that we've described. So as we go forward, we're going to develop more complicated models that will separate means for groups into more pieces. But at the end of the day, we're still representing the mean of a group, but on the basis of separate components. So far, our inferences about treatment effects have been limited to the effect of a single factor. That is, we were testing simply toss sub j's. But what we'll do now is develop a two-factor linear model that'll allow us to form hypothesis tests in multi-factor experimental designs. Now let's take a real life example. I showed you when I introduced variability my two different graphs of times to campus based on two different routes, one taking Gilman Drive and one taking La Jolla Village Drive. I've been collecting data on different routes to campus for quite a while, so I have much more data than this to show you. But let's pause for a second and think about this design. If I just took Gilman Drive and La Jolla Village Drive, I really have a single factor design, a design with one factor being the route I took. And I only have one possible test with these data. That is, what is the effective route? Is Gilman Drive or La Jolla Village Drive faster? Now, there's another factor I could consider, something completely independent of which route I take to campus. And that might be what time of day I'm driving to campus at. So if I also measured at 8 a.m. and 9.30 a.m. the average time it takes me to get to campus, I would also have only one test I could actually run. That is, what is the effective time? Is it faster for me to get to campus if I leave at 8 or 9.30? Now, what's great about multi-factor studies is that I can measure these two simultaneously. And by measuring them together, I get one additional test beyond simply the effective route and the effective time. Now let me step back. If I'm measuring these factors in a multi-factor design, what I will do is measure each cell in this grid. That is, Gilman Drive at 8 a.m., Gilman Drive at 9.30, La Jolla Village Drive at 8 a.m., and La Jolla Village Drive at 9.30. Notice that I still have the data to measure those first two effects, the overall effective route and the overall effective time. But by measuring these two factors together, I get an important third effect, the effect of the specific route and time combinations. Now, we'll spend a little bit of time in this module decomposing that third effect. It turns out to be a very important one for multi-factor studies, but let's first give this design a name. This is known as a full factorial design. And a full factorial design is a multi-factor design in which two or more factors are completely crossed. And by that I mean measurements are taken for every combination of factor levels. And if we look at our grid, see that I do have measurements, if I actually did this study, and I have, I have measurements for each combination. I will actually measure at 8 a.m. both Gilman Drive and La Jolla Village Drive, and at 9.30 a.m. I'll measure the time it takes at both Gilman Drive and La Jolla Village Drive. Now, in order to do this study properly so that the inferences we draw from differences we observe are actually valid, I still had to use random assignment. 
The way it worked out for this study is, I took a large number of days and randomly assigned myself to one of these conditions. That is, some combination here of factor A, the route I was taking, and factor B, what time I left to go to campus. Now, although I did collect a lot of data for this, the data we're going to work through is a little bit cleaned up. So that's why it's listed as IBRD, inspired by real data. Now, there were some violations to assumptions that we'll come back to later that I had to clean up to look at these data. But the mean structure I'm going to show you, that is the means we observe, are actually honoring the true means that I observed. So in this case, we actually do have measurements in each of these combinations. That is, I actually can show you the average time it took me for each combination of factor A, the different routes, and factor B, the different times. And from these means, we're going to be able to test these three separate tests. The overall effect of route, ignoring time, the overall effect of time, ignoring route, and the effect of a specific route and time combination.